Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm R. Srikant. I'm the chair of the EC Launch Committee. And on behalf of uh, Jonathan Makala and Shu Ling Lee, who are my co-chairs over there, uh, I'd like to welcome you to this EC Launch Beyond event. Um, in case you're, okay, am I supposed to stand closer to this? Okay. Uh, uh, um, in case uh, you're wondering what the Launch Beyond title means, uh, as you all know, this new building was opened last year, and in some sense, it launched a new era for our department. And so we've had a year-long celebration called Launch, where we've had many distinguished lecturers and workshops highlighting major technological and scientific breakthrough, breakthroughs in the ECE discipline. The Launch Beyond event goes beyond that, and we want to look into the future. And so we've invited many of our distinguished alumni and friends to give us their vision for the ECE education and research of the future. Okay? Uh, before we start our main program, I'd like to invite Dean Andreas Cangelaris and uh, Department Head Bill Sanders to make a few remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Srikant, and good morning and welcome to EC Illinois. We are very proud to have you here for the Launch Beyond. Um, I am an EC faculty member. I say that because, uh, you know, in academia you may have various titles, but the thing that you hold dear to your heart is the fact that you are a faculty member in a department that, uh, in our case, has been the foundation of the success of this college, this campus. And I say that because we are thinking about the future of ECE moving forward, and we have with us a community that has been influential in many different ways. I will let Bill, the department head, tell you about the ECE community and its, uh, its successes over the years, but I would like, as dean of the college, to tell you about the future of the college and how we think about it in a way that I believe is pretty much founded on the way EC over the years has influenced the world. So some of the things we're trying to do is we're trying to change the way we educate students. Not only our students in the College of Engineering, but our students all over campus. One out of four students in this campus are engineering students. One out of four. And the way we think about it is this gives us the opportunity to make sure that every student, every student that comes to the University of Illinois develops an approach to life, an approach to professionalism that has some of the elements of our engineering thinking, and that is there are only problems in life. At the end of the day, if you think about it, there are moments we enjoy and there are moments we work very hard to conquer new problems. And problems need to be embraced because the way you embrace problems projects the way you think about the future. We do a great job at Illinois in engineering doing that, and we want to make sure that every student who comes to this campus makes that a priority. Their education, their presence on this campus is empowered by thinking about how I conquer the next problem, and by doing so, how I change the world. So that engineering element in the education of every student at the University of Illinois is something we're trying to do, and we are doing it because we believe that in a century that is so influenced by technology, the most important thing is thinking about how technology empowers the lives of people. The second thing we're trying to do is we're trying to have a new approach to medicine, a new approach to wellness, engineering-based. An engineering-based college of medicine that could not have been possible without the College of Engineering on this campus. And the way we approach it is very simple. Healthcare is broken, we need to fix it, it will take an engineer. Health and wellness is a challenge, we need to figure it out, it will take an engineer. But it will take an engineer that is passionate about the world around them. And so we are actually approaching this problem in a way that smells and feels like ECE at Illinois. Where will the foundation for this College of Medicine be? On the College of Engineering. Bioengineering, a department that came out of ECE, as many of you know, is going to become the department that is going to be housed in Everett Lab. What is Everett Lab? The old headquarters of electrical and computer engineering. There is, a, there is a, a hint there. We go back to our roots, we go back to where great things start, 
And we started and we used that as the launch pad for the next, next fr frontier, the launch beyond as we call it, that is all driven by the elements that made EC famous. So thank you for joining us. This will be a very interesting day. Let's not think only about the past. Let's think about the future. At the end of the day, students come here because they want to think about the future in a way that transforms their lives, and by transforming their lives, transforms the lives of everybody else. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us for this day. Thank you, Srikant, for helping with the organization of this special event. Srikant has been leading many of the activities of the launch, and thank you all for uh, being part of it. Thank you, Andreas. I'm glad you uh, said you were an EC faculty, and I may be department head, but I'm really glad to be an EC faculty member as well. Uh, but as department head, and as Andreas promised, I want to say just a few things, both about the legacy of this department and, the, uh, and its future. And I think you all know, uh, particularly those who are students now and those who are alumni, this, this place has an incredible legacy. In fact, it's a, le a legacy that makes me feel that I have an immense responsibility as department head as we look to the future, right? It was the place that invented sound on film. It was the place that had the first use of ultrasound uh, for medical devices. Uh, it was the place where the faculty member uh, uh, co-invented the transistor. It's the place where an alumni invented the integrated circuit, the plasma display the first use of social networks through Plato, right, in the 1960s. The world may not know that, but that, that really was invented here. So it's an incredible place, right? And uh, you, if you look then, and you look at our alumni, and many of them are here today, um, it's the place that really changed Silicon Valley, right? If you look at what's happened in Silicon <coughs> Valley, both in the base, you know, both in photonics, both in high-speed communications, electric vehicles, computer aid design, distributed systems and networking, the dot-com revolution. These are just a few of the things that, that, uh, that, that were done by our alumni in the Silicon Valley. I mean, the Silicon Valley would not be there and it would be not the kind of place it is if it wasn't for our alums. ECE has also led the way in innovation and education. I think this is incredibly important. We're an extremely strong department with an extremely competitive set of people who want to come to, to study here. And I think it's because of the holistic way we look at education. Some of the very early innovations in our electrical uh, engineering curriculum were driven by a very systems view, that we don't think of circuits, for example, as a separate thing, but we think of them as part of the broad system that we consider electrical engineering. Our new computer engineering curriculum, in fact, that just came into play about a year ago, um, takes the same view. It thinks not of computer engineering as just chip design, but it thinks of it as chips within a computing system. It thinks of programming within a computing system, and that kind of innovation really is leading the way. We have an immense demand for both of our programs, and in fact, by far, uh, we have the most students in, in the College of Engineering. Um, we have just introduced, in fact, three weeks ago, we just had approved a new Master's of Engineering program. Uh, this Master's of Engineering program will educate people uh, in very practical things. It will be focused on a professional education. And as a master's degree becomes a de facto engineering degree to move forward in industry, uh, we're going to provide an easy way for our students to uh, excel in that program. In fact, there's a combined bachelor's and master's program in which students can almost think of as somewhere between four and five year program in which they can receive a bachelor's and a master's uh, from, our, from our department. Now, it's not going to be easy, and these are going to be the rigorous courses that uh, you all know, those of you who are alumni, but I think it provides a very uh, straightforward pass for our students to move forward. But launch is about the future, as Dean Cangalera said, right? Launch is about the future and not the past. And in fact, as I said at the beginning, um, as I took this job and as I studied about this department, I've been here over 20 years, but you get a new perspective as department head, studying about this department, I felt an immense responsibility to figure out the way we can do it all over again, right? 
It's a time of, of, of great opportunity. We have the best students in the world here. We have the best faculty in the world here. We have the best facility, right? If you look at our new building here together with our interdisciplinary labs, we have the best facility in the world here and we have the best alumni. We have 22,000 alumni that are out there and they're working with us and for us and together with us to make this all happen. It's a time of immense growth. We're on a path to hire between 35 and 40 new faculty in the next five years. And that's a real opportunity, but that's also a real responsibility. So what we want to do today, and as you heard Srikant say and Andrea say, what we want to do today is listen to you, interact with you, together think about what a broad and holistic view of the future of education, of research, of impact in society is going to be for ECE. And it is the department and our department in particular that spawns people to do so many things. And I think we need to think about what kind of education and research will be needed to really make this kind of society that we all believe we should have. So thank you very much. I'm excited to see you all here. Um, I'm looking forward to an incredibly interactive day. I'm going to be listening carefully and maybe asking a hard question or two. The students from my class know how I do that. Um, so. Um, I'll hand the mic back to Shrikant now and let him introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea and Bill. So I'd like to now introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Emin Wang. So Emin got his PhD from our department in 1993. Since 1998, he has been at Microsoft, where he's currently the managing director of Microsoft Research Technologies. He's also a distinguished scientist of Microsoft Research, recognized for his contributions to dependable computing and web security, and for his leadership in the research area. Uh, Emin is a fellow of the IEEE and a distinguished alumnus award winner from our department. Please join me in welcoming Emin. Is the mic on now? Thank you, Andreas and Bill, for inviting me here. And thank you all for coming. Uh, this is a special year for me to come back. Um, 27 years ago, my wife and I came here right after we got married. And both of our kids are actually born in the hospital two blocks north of here. The younger one has graduated from college last year. And they have started their career in computer software so I think it's fair to say that the education that we received here, my wife and I, both on the <coughs> technical side and on the cultural side, actually laid the foundation for the career of our entire family. So uh, this city, this university, and this department will always have a special place in my heart. And I also saw uh, Professor David Monson uh, yesterday, and uh, the probability test that <laughs> I had uh, from his class is the hardest <laughs> test in my entire life. <laughs> I still remember that classroom, sweating in there, but I came out OK. Yeah. So I'll talk about academia to industry, scale up the ambition, and scale up for the impact. I borrow these terminologies from the distributed system and the database community. But this is actually going to be a different kind of talk. I, uh, when I received the invitation, I thought about it and say, what should be the goal of this talk? Because we all listen to hundreds of thousands of talks in our lifetime. We don't remember many of them. So I thought, let's have a, a measure. Let's say, 10 years from now, if 10% of you remember one thing I say and still find it useful, then I'll call this talk a success. OK, so I prepared this talk with that in mind. All you need to do is please remember one thing for me and 10 years later tell me it's useful. <laughs> okay. And uh, <coughs> I graduated in 1993, uh, PhD in uh, electrical and computer engineering. And uh, I joined AT&T Bell Labs for four and a half years, moved to Microsoft Research. I was been there, I've been there for 17, 18 years. And my career has kind of divided into three stages. The first third, I was trying to do great research. The second third, 
at trying to turn my research into real world impact. The final part that in the past seven to eight years, I manage teams and trying to turn their research into real world impact. So I've seen a lot of uh, distinguished alumni here. Some of them are very distinguished academic. Some of them are very successful entrepreneurs. Some of them are very successful venture capital investors. And some of them are very experienced product engineers. My career is kind of in the intersection of all four of them. So give me a broad test of everything. But things I said here, you actually can get even better insight by talking to each of them when you are particularly interested in a particular kind of uh, career. So 22 years, and I asked myself, what have I learned? I only learned four things. And I'd like to share these four things with you. And I asked myself, if before I graduated, somebody told me these four things, would that make a difference? The answer is yes. So I, I hope that this will make a difference for you too. So this is also my outline. Maximize the max, not the sum. Good is the enemy of great. Think end to end. And EQ as the operator for IQs. OK, so let me go in there. First, let me describe two things that my organization has been doing to give you a flavor of what kind of innovation we are doing. So Skype translator, some of you will be able to use it very soon. That it basically allows you to do Skype communication in different languages. So you can speak in English, and the Spanish will come on the other side. So people who don't understand English can just say uh, Spanish and communicate with you. This one came very unexpected, because I don't know if many of you remember, during the 2000s, there's a 10-year span where the speech recognition error rate is just not going down. And during that time, I remember telling my wife, with my accent, I probably never used speech recognition in my lifetime. <laughs> but something happened in 2009. Uh, our researcher, Dong Yu and Li Deng Lei, bring in, they brought in um, Professor Jeff Hinton from Toronto to apply deep neural net to industrial skill, uh, scale rec recognition and had a breakthrough. And ever since then, the world error rate has been dropping, and all the conversational agents come out of Google, and Apple, and Microsoft. And the other day, I had a funny conversation with my wife, because my wife is more resourceful. I always ask, for things, ask her things, and she will look it up for me. <laughs> and one morning, I asked her two questions, and both answers from her is, ask Cortana. Ask Cortana, why are you asking me? And Cortana is the Microsoft agent. Basically, so it has come to the point that we expect that if you ask the conversational agent, she will be able to understand, and she actually can do the automatic search for you. So the world has changed a lot since the <coughs> past few years. At the same time, our machine translation incubation effort has been steadily increasing the accuracy of the machine translation. So at 2010, my uh, our Senior Vice President at that time, Rick Rashid, he's a Star, Tra Star Trek fan. He always wants to deliver speech in English and have Chinese come out when he speaks uh, in uh, Chinese. So in 2010, he tried. And at the last minute, he sent out an email and said, we have to cancel the demo because the auditorium sound quality is not good enough. <laughs> Next year, 2011, he tried again and who gave, up, gave up again because we're just not there. 2012. He tried it again in Tianjin, and this is the time it was successful. And he delivered that in front of thousands of Chinese students, and some of them were crying because they were actually witnessing the future. They were able to hear Chinese translation in Rick's voice coming out, and they were not expecting that. So after that, we're very proud. It's a research demonstration. So when our new CEO came in, and among all the innovations from Microsoft, he picked the one Skype translator demo as the demo he wanted to do in his first public interview. And we were very proud and we were very scared. <laughs> because as you know, speech recognition wasn't completely perfect. Machine translation is not perfect. So my technical people was telling me, if you combine both, it's going to be a disaster. <laughs> We did the demo, it worked. And you can see Asatya in the middle smiling <laughs> because it worked. 
And then he surprised us from that stage saying, announcing to the world, we're going to ship this thing in six months. <laughs> <laughs> and we, there was a period of silence in the conference room where we're watching and we were looking at each other. <laughs> and he, managed, he announced to us, we have to do it. And we scramble and release it in December 2014, a standalone app with just one language pair, English to Spanish. And that generated a lot of positive uh, excitement. And uh, even the skeptics are calling it uh, magical transformation or awe-inspiring. We don't see that kind of word, words for a lot of Microsoft products. So <laughs> we were very <laughs> proud there. And then we thought about it and said, it's just a standalone app. And uh, how can we do better? And Microsoft does have a Skype application that has hundreds of millions of users. So we recently shipped through Skype. And this is rolling out. So the new version of Skype will roll out to hundreds of millions of users. And X percent of those people will have Skype Translator turned on. And we'll see how it goes. And the reason I see how it goes is this is a big risk. We could always say, let's do speech recognition research for another two years. Machine translation research for another two years. Then it's lower risk. But this time we just decide that somebody got to take the first step. And if the world like it, they will provide feedback and usage to help us move forward. We took that bet. And I think the world is moving forward. We started seeing people from India speaking English, trying to sell something to people in Argentina speaking Spanish. And the deal was going through. So they were not able to do that. Now they can do that. And we have people working in the nonprofit organization. Their New York office can finally talk to their South American office because they used to don't talk to each other a lot. And there are even Seattle Public School, they are using this as a transcription service for hard of hearing students. So the teacher is actually talking in Skype. And it goes to a Surface tablet sitting on top of a desktop of a deaf student. <coughs> And of course, they don't play sound there. They simply just read the script there. So all kinds of creative applications are now being created. So we're very excited about that. The second one is Guinness World Record. We, we, were, we have a researcher who wants to do a very powerful, very intelligent shape writing text input system. And we say, OK, we well, can do another one. But how can we make sure we are the world's best? So they say, there's a Guinness World Record that at that time is 40-something uh, uh, seconds, I believe. And we set a goal to break that record in a year. And we did it. We broke it. And of course, later on, people will break it again with more powerful machines. But we also created a new record called on a touch screen, uh, blindfolded texting. OK, so if you search, so you do a Google search or Bing search of touch screen blinded, you actually see that we are still the um, Guinness World Record of that one. And there's one sentence, one really weird sentence about piranha. If you can finish that one and you can beat 25.9 blindfolded, then you will have the new Guinness World Record. So you can try that one. So those two are the kind of research that we're shooting for. Be the world's best, and then move the world forward. OK, so let me come to the first point, maximizing the max, not the sum. I when we have an intern come in, I will show this slide. And the intern will look at me and say, I, I, I'm not even an IEEE uh, member yet. What are you talking about, IEEE fellow? <laughs> and I say, you want to take a look at uh, this fellowship, a uh, fellow um, application form. Because it's part one. It says, list the three most important items. And then part two say, list the next 10 items. So you start asking yourself, what's your most important paper? And of course, it's the first one, because it's also your best one. What's your next important paper? It's the fourth one, because if it doesn't get into top three, maybe you want to think harder. And what's the next one? It's the 14th one. If it doesn't change the top 13, it doesn't change your career at all, according to Ajipoy Fellow. So when you think about it that way, then you understand that uh, the career that you have chosen is being measured by these top ones. So unless you're maximizing the max, you don't advance your career. And that's also the same thing that happens in corporate promotion. Some people will work hard, do a lot of things, and come to me and say, how much do I need to do? 
how many years do I need to work in order for me to get to the next, pro next level? I always say, write down your top ones. And if it doesn't change, you'll never get promoted. And once you change to the level that <coughs> match the next level, you'll be naturally promoted. So the question is never how much and how long. So here, what we learned is uh, the top three is basically the core of your max. The next 10 is the whole of your max. And then the rest is the sum part. Now, I sometimes also do the sum part because I want to have fun. So sometimes I just publish a paper just for fun. Okay, knowing that it doesn't advance my career, that's fun. But that's fine because I want to have fun. But you got to <laughs> make sure that you ask this question and what's your max, what's your sum? And the reality concept is actually called less or more. Uh, I used to have a very productive person. Every time I asked him to send me status update, he always write long emails. <laughs> because every few weeks he's able to achieve so much. And I finally told him that if you send me three points, I'll read them and remember it very clearly. If you insist on sending me five points, I'll try to read them, but I'll forget about your top three. If you send me a list of 10, then I'll put a reminder on my email to read it later, and I'll never read it. <laughs> That's just how the, the manager works. That's how the leaders work. So that basically said less is more, because less is more memorable. Okay. So during my performance review, every year we need to write the performance review. And again, people want to write a whole year of achievement in a long document. I said, no, you can only have one page, font 11 or bigger. <laughs> because people start squeezing me. And you can write two pages. I won't read the second page. You have to read the first. You have to squeeze all your top contribution into the first page. And then finally, people all get, in, get into the habit of doing that. And then one day, I receive a, a performance review form, and I open it up. There's only a quarter page. So I immediately thought this guy sent me the wrong draft. So I was going to send it back. And I said, let me read it. And after I read the four bullet point on that quarter page, I said, this is a performance review form. I need no more for his entire year of a contribution. Because less is also most significant. When you are that confident, you don't need a page. All you need is quarter page. Yes? Which one? Yes. Is that okay now? Okay. Oh, so I've been talking without mine. So I have a big voice. <laughs> and I think people from uh, the venture, well, venture capital community knows that there is an eight second rule. Basically, for busy executives, you only have eight seconds to get your idea across. So that's also the less is more significant part. So maximizing the max, less is more, it has a lot to do with risk-taking. Risk -taking. And uh, so I use this as an example. This is HoloLens, the demo. This is basically the augmented reality with virtual hologram that can be imposed on top of the actual reality you're seeing. And uh, one thing I learned about a hologram is when we released this one, I realized there's something that's beyond magical transformation and awe-inspiring, and it's called insane but real. So when they released the hologram, it really expand human's uh, imagination. And it's done by Alex Kipman, which is our, uh, our uh, technical fellow who also shipped Connect back in uh, 2010. And now he's trying to ship uh, HoloLens. And he, when we invited him to come to, to give a talk to us, he had this very famous quote here. He said, if I put 100 wicked smart people in a room and tell them something that's hard, improbable, 99 of them will try to explain to him why this is not possible. Let's not even try it. But there's always one guy who will say, well, it's not probable, but we can make it happen if we work hard and commit it. And that's always the one person who worked with him to ship Connect, and we're going to ship HoloLens. So this one is related to maximizing the max. Because if you believe in maximizing the max, risk taking is natural. Because if you don't take risk, you have no chance of maximizing your max. If you take risk, then at least you have a chance. You might fail, but at least you have a chance of maximizing the max. So your natural tendency will be to think about what can you do, not what you cannot do. Okay. And that will help you in any kinds of career, I believe. In 
MSR, we also have uh, this kind of new process that's going on, and we, we learned this from the venture capital community. You all know that Microsoft Research Lab has been a basic research lab. In the past year, we actually split the organization into two. Both of them are continuing basic research, but they are doing things differently. In the Microsoft Research Labs, people continue to do curiosity-driven research, advanced state of art, and let somebody else come in later to take the technology to change the world. In the new organization I'm in called MSR Next, stands for New, Techno new Experience and Technologies. We have a impact-driven research agenda. We always start by asking the question, in N years, what are you trying to achieve? And that's just one slide. You have to write down the statement. And you have to refine it to be very concrete. And then we'll ask the question, does this one move the needle for the company? The company is making about um, $90 billion revenue every year. In that context, does it move the needle for the company? Or you move the world big step forward. Because we believe if we move the big step forward, it will change the company later. And for, for example, our machine translator effort is not just shipping Skype translator. Their goal is actually in four years, we are going to bring down the language barrier for humans. So no matter where you go, you should not feel the language barrier anymore. After that, after you specify the ambition, of course we'll uh, need to ask you, do you really have a credible plan to get there? Now, plan can change every day. But every day you've got to have a plan. Otherwise, you'll never get there. And once you specify an ambitious goal, you have a credible plan to get there. We'll ask about well, how much resources do you need. And this is the part that MSR Next actually provided to our uh, researchers. Because we do have resources if you can convince us what you're trying to do is ambitious. But once you give you the resources, we ask something for return. Every six months, you've got to come back here and say you hit your milestone. And by the time you finish all your milestones, you achieve your end year goal. Okay, so this is our new process. And it really makes people uncomfortable but at the end of the day, people feel good about it because they know that if they've succeeded in doing this, they will maximize the max and change their career. So that's the first part about maximizing the max. The next part is about good is the enemy of great. I think this quote started with something and got misquoted and then got formally defined in one of the books. And it all started with uh, this. So I recently read the book called The Power of Habit, and it explains that uh, the, our brain is always trying to find patterns to put on autopilot so that it can be more efficient, so that you don't exhaust yourself by making daily decisions. And uh, it always starts with a cue that will trigger a craving for a reward. Then it will push you to automatically perform the routine to achieve the reward. So I learned that the reason that I must brush my teeth after lunch is because they put some unnecessary ingredients into the toothpaste to give you that tinkling feeling that your brain <laughs> equates into the notion of cleanness. So after every lunch, that's the cue, you will brush your teeth because you're craving for that tinkling feeling, which is the, uh, the cleanness. Uh, in researchers, after you are in research career for a few years, you will have another kind of feedback loop because your craving is to get your paper accepted in the top conferences. So next time when you so see this cue, this is such a promising technical direction that I can turn into the best conference paper. Then that will trigger your routine to perform the research, write the paper, submit the paper, get the paper accepted, get the reward, and then you go back to find the next cue. And then you put it on autopilot. Uh, let me ask you, how many of you are international students coming from foreign country? Okay, okay, so this probably applied to you. You probably heard this before. From your childhood, you're smart, and therefore you should get a PhD because nobody else can. You are the smart one. You're doing very well in your PhD research. You should get a researcher job. And they pay you a lot of money and let you do whatever you want. What can be better than that? You will live happily ever after. <laughs> really. And, and they do pay you a lot. If you don't believe me. Is that what your mom told you? 
Uh, exactly. No, <laughs> my mom doesn't have to t tell me. The thing is, that's kind of implicit in, in the background that I came from. And of course, this is true. And of course, you'll be successful. And then so you are on autopilot. And you're very productive and very successful. You don't think about if there's anything wrong here. Until one day you wake up and ask yourself, Am I just good at doing research? Am I so good that I could have succeeded in everything I chose to do? And I, one day I woke up and asked myself that question. That's why I started doing more things. Because good is the enemy of great, and great is the enemy of best. When you're a good researcher, and when you're, when you're getting paying, paid a lot of money to do whatever you want, you cannot imagine you can do better. And everything else is outside your comfort zone. And if you're already good, why do you want to take a risk? to try it. But what if you can be great there? And once you're great, something else comes out that's completely out of your comfort zone, and you don't want to try it. What if that's your best there? And if you never try, you never know. Okay, and, and this one has happened many times in Microsoft, when researchers get to a certain stage and they really want to try the impact on the world. Some of them move to the product team and discover this is actually my career. Career is much better here. I want to stay here. And some of them actually tried to have a couple of years and decided to go back to research and say, that's why I understand I will never go to product team ever again. I like research. <laughs> Either way, it's very good. Yeah. So now if you are thinking about, I don't know whether I'm just an accidental researcher because of my background, then you start thinking about there are three levels of happiness. And it's called Pleasure, engagement, and meaning. And pleasure is a short-term happiness. Engagement is the medium-term meaning. Is, and, and meaning is the long-term meaning. Is. Then you start thinking about the thing that you have been enjoying and putting in this category. It turns out research freedom and comfort zone, which is the only thing I wanted when I graduated, was only pleasure. It gives you comfort. It gives you freedom. It gives you an easy life if you want. But that's pleasure. It disappears after a while. Even when you are very passionate and very productive and you have a lot of job satisfaction, you still want to ask, is this just engagement? Does it have long-term meaning for my life? And by the time you go to here, this is the long-term one. This is the impact. And this is basically every five to 10 years, you look back in your life and say, this past 10 years, I've done this. Is that the best way to spend my life? And ultimately, that's the happiness. Because all the other pleasure and engagement, they have disappeared. And uh, by the way, this is when I created the UIUC Endowed Fund for Research Award. Because um, Research Award Endowed Fund is about using the interest every year to fund a student. So it's perpetual. It never runs out. So the reasoning is very simple. If you create an endowed fund, 50, 100 years from now, I will have no pleasure and no engagement. But every year, the research award is impacting a student's life, and that translates into the meaning of my life. So that decision then becomes very clear. Okay. So think about this and decide what you want. Maybe people just decide, I just want engagement, I just want pleasure, that's fine. But if you want impact, then impact is very hard to measure. And here's one way that you could measure it. So on the y-axis here, it says number of people impacted. I want to use that as the measure. And you have uh, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 1 billion there. On the x-axis, it's about the investment per year. OK, 100K up to $100 million. Now, a researcher in our organization publishing a research paper is about $100,000 investment a year. And it has about 100 to 500 people uh, in the conference listening to you and reading your paper. Sometimes we put researchers together. It's more expensive. Produce actually a working prototype for our tech fest internal show. Then that's a more significant artifact there. Sometimes we decide this one we got to release to the world in order to attract more users. Now we're talking about 5 million to 10 million a year investment, but it can reach 1 million users. And if you want more, you have to go to a product group because they are the one who can give you $100 million and let you reach one billions of users if you choose that as the meaning of your life. 
Research freedom dropped. <laughs> Research freedom dropped. And why would you be willing to do that? Because you are willing to sacrifice your short-term pleasure for long-term <laughs> meaning. So it also becomes a very easy decision once you decide what you want. <coughs> internship. I have a lot of students who come into industry to do internship. And all they want is, here's my PhD thesis. Can I find a research topic that's very close to my PhD thesis? Publish the paper to help me get my uh, PhD faster. That's all they want. And I want to encourage them to think about this very differently. Internship is giving you opportunity to say, maybe I want this kind of impact. Or I want this kind of impact. Or I want that kind of impact. So use internship to decide what you want in life instead of just assume what you want in life is there and just try to make it faster. And in fact, when you do things that are beyond your PhD research, you'll have much better resume. You have much broader resume. So when we receive an, a resume and we look at the candidates and say, oh, his research area, her research area is not really what we want. Hey, but they did these two internship programs. It sounds very interesting. Let's invite them for interview. Okay, so keep that in mind when you go to the industry. Internship is the opportunity to help you find out where you can be good at, where you might be great at, and where your best place is. Third one is called think end to end. Now, if you want to have industry impact, uh, apparent, uh, obviously you need this kind of end to end impact. And I put down two orders of magnitude improvement here because um, these days, we're all shooting for orders of magnitude improvement so that uh, it can make a difference. But not every two orders of magnitude improvement will make a difference. Because as scientists, as engineers, we all know that if you take a problem, you attack 99% of the problem, it's two orders of magnitude improvement. But if that problem is simply 1% of a big problem, then 99% Two orders of magnitude improvement is only 1% of improvement. Okay. And I think people in parallel computing know this uh, in the context of MDOT's law, where the sequential part just cannot be optimized, and that will bound your contribution. I learned a painful lesson in the early stage of my career. That's this is even more true when you're talking about taking your research to real-world impact. So I'll share two lessons with you. Um, back in the 2000s, I built something called Strider Troubleshooter. Many of you who use Windows application at that time suffer from this registry problem. Your application suddenly stopped working because yesterday you installed something that messed with the registry. You don't know which one. There are hundreds of thousands of registry entries. And then, so how do you diagnose that problem? It's a messy engineering problem, and we're so proud that we find out a scientific problem or a scientific solution. <clears throat> we compare your registry snapshot with uh, a few days ago to find out what has changed. We find out which registry entry is actually affecting your application performance. And then we do statistical analysis across different machines and across different entries to find out which one is more likely to be the root cause. And we were able to use scientific method to solve this messy engineering problem and reduce the number of culprits from thousands of entries down to about 10, 10 entries. Then you can diagnose and fix the problem. So we're very proud and we are so sure we can make a real world impact. And we actually went down to Colorado Spring to train the support engineer who pick up your phone and answer your question. We trained them for a week, and I even sat down and put on the headset and start receiving customer phone call. The call comes in. You don't even know whether it's a problem or they're just asking, how do I do that? How do I do that? How do I do that? And I kept asking, don't you have a registry problem? <laughs> no. They just want to. <laughs> they just want to know how to do that. And I said, wrong. No, I still need to answer them. And then finally, you have a problem. Is it a persistent state problem? No. Sometimes it's just a memory problem, or sometimes a device problem, hardware problem. Don't you have a persistent state problem? Come on. And once you have a persistent state problem, is it a registry problem? I hope it's not a file problem. Because I cannot solve a fire problem. I can only solve a registry problem. I have the world's best tool to solve that problem. No? Or finally, we got a registry problem. And the reason we went through this is 
I was so proud that when uh, Leslie Lamport, the Turing Award winner, he got a registry problem. <laughs> he reached out to me. I actually solved the problem for him. By the time we actually saw registry problem from customer, two issues came up, skill issue and cost issue. Yes, I can sit there. I can solve that problem. But most of the frontline support engineers, they just cannot do it because they don't have the skill set. And you cannot put people like me at the front line support because it's not scalable. It's not cost effective. Second one is, even if you can solve the problem, you may not want to spend time to solve the problem because every support call is costing money. After a few minutes, you pretty much don't make money out of the customer anymore. So you want to somehow make the problem go away very quickly, not to solve the problem precisely by finding the root cause. That's, that's such a painful experience. I went in so proud. I went back to Redmond. I canceled my research project because it's not the right problem to solve when you think end to end. Next one is not as painful, but it's a different kind of end to end. So I have a Strider Honey Monkey project, which is probably my most well-known research project. And it can automatically identify malicious websites on the web. And uh, we're targeting on um, large-scale exploits that uh, based on redirection website. And I'll explain this. Here are a lot of uh, high-traffic content websites. So if the bad guys want to put exploit on all of them, it becomes very expensive because that's millions. Just deploy the exploit, take a lot of time. So what they do is they use redirection. When you go to that website, they say redirect to this site. Then they can serve all the exploits from this website. So that's the thing. Now, so if you can identify those uh, smaller number of redirection websites, you don't need to solve the harder problem. So that's several order of magnitude. And so we actually find out where are they trying to exploit people. And at that time, it's about pornography websites, some other travel websites. So we identify most of them. And we decide to do monkeys. Monkeys means uh, they mimic humans. So monkeys browse a web page just like a human. Honey monkey means it's actually a honey pot. So the honey monkey is actually running on a virtual machine intentionally left unpatched. So they are just like a vulnerable user. So now imagine if we know where those bad guys are and you use honey monkey to monitor them every day. Every time a new exploit come in, the first thing that got hit is a honey monkey. Then you get them, you shut them down, then they have to move. But once they move, they still need to connect to the traffic website where users know where to get to, but you are monitoring there. So as soon as they move to a different redirection site, you detect them again, you shut them down again. This problem then should disappear from the world because finally we found a way that is a very scalable solution of identifying bad guys, shut them down, cause heavy loss on their side. So things were going well until one day, my lawyer, my Microsoft lawyer actually came to me and said, we got to talk. Because it turns out that when you want to take down an ISP, an internet service provider, because you are hosting a malicious website, you need to send them a legal letter. And some of that legal, legal letter took $1,000 a piece. And when you send the legal letter to an ISP in a foreign country, most of the, half of them actually ignore you. Because now you're touching the law issue. And international, you don't have jurisdiction. So even if you identify them, you cannot shut them down. Okay. So that's another example I've learned about end to end. Uh, when legal issue is in here, when international issue is in here, things get even harder. Here comes to the fourth part, and this is probably the most important thing in life that the school don't teach. The most important thing in life the school don't teach. It's called emotional intelligence. So IQ is intelligence, EQ is emotional intelligence. And, the re and EQ, there's a lot of books out there, so I won't bore you with the description. It generally has something to do with understand your own emotion, control your own emotion, and they try to understand other people's emotion and influence their emotion. So that's called emotional intelligence. And uh, I put it as an operator for EQ here. Because in our community, we all have high IQ people. But high IQ people may not work together very well. So when you have 
high IQ people with low EQ, they subtract <laughs> IQ from each other, the productivity is zero, no matter how smart you are. And this is what I learned from Bill Gates. He once told people, because Microsoft used to have this culture. Uh, the reason I put up this one, some people recognize, this is a cartoon of the org chart of old Microsoft. Guns to each other. And the reason I put on this one is, the company has changed because we cannot continue like that. Because then you got zero productivity. All you do as a manager is trying to get people to work together. And then they spend a lot of time fighting each other instead of working on the work. Ideally, we want people to work with each other so their IQ actually add to each other. And ideally, we want them to work so well that they help each other and amplify each other and become multiplied. OK, so that's what I mean by EQ as the operator. And fortunately, it's not just Microsoft. There's another very successful high-tech company also recently observed ob observe this. And sorry, I have to gray those <laughs> words out because it's in the article. I don't want to leave it out, but I don't want to show it. It says, in this very successful high-tech company, in order to be a leader in that company, your technical ability have to be three plus standard deviation. You have to be that good to be a leadership there. And in fact, in any high-tech, very successful company, you have to do that. But that trait doesn't necessarily correlate with emotional intelligence. And he says it's a capacity for empathy. And then he said, the savants usually aren't people persons. I think that just summarizes it all. That uh, high EQ people, sometimes they just don't spend a lot of time learning EQ. And eventually, you need to work with people. And if there's no EQ, then your IQ is subtracting his IQ. Then it's just not very productive. So I, I would suggest that the students learn EQ as soon as you can. And there are a lot of training classes that are out there. There are books out there. But there are also day-to-day -day training opportunities. And I'll present two of them. Training number, opportunity number one, the credit issue. The credit issue means you can author a paper with somebody else. Who should be the first author? And you talk to someone about your research result, and which leads to a paper. Should he be in the acknowledgment only, or should he be a paper author? And you know, sometimes people fight, and things get ugly, and they will never work with each other again. So if you're willing to train your EQ, there's one sentence that's very simple that I learned from Rick Rasher. It's called, the more credit you share, the more credit you have. And at first, it doesn't make sense. But let me explain to you why it makes perfect sense. Because what is the thing you achieve? Suppose you achieve something great, it's 100%. But it's also about how you achieve it. So if you achieve it through great collaboration, and people like each other, and people appreciate each other's contribution, you got another 100% so that when you share, each of, them, each of you has 100%. On the other end, if you achieve a great result, and you keep fighting with each other. And everybody, when they talk about this work, there's always some ugliness in this work. Then you subtract 50% out of it. And then you share you only have 25%. And it goes beyond this, because if you work well with people, more people want to work with you. So you have more 100% to share in the future. <coughs> if you keep fighting with people, fewer people want to collaborate with you. You have fewer 25%. Now you think about, in your entire lifetime, how much more credit you can get from, by sharing credit. And I say it here because I actually see this in my organization. It's true. It's true. So think about this one. The second one is training opportunity is angry email. <laughs> now, email is not a good communication medium for discussing difficult issues. Really. And, but somehow people like to write email, and sometimes people are not comfortable in in-person confrontation. They would rather use email. And because email lacks context, so people just get angry and angrier. OK, so, but next time if you receive angry email, treat it as an EQ training opportunity. And only remember one thing. <laughs> Anything you say can and will be used against you. Okay. And this is also true because I've seen people, you send an email, it got forwarded to other people. Other people look at this argument, they don't have enough context. 
They just to see two people behaving badly, then they say, yeah, both of them are bad. And that's their impression. That's their impression of you. And email you write, you have to assume it will be forwarded to anybody in the whole world. Because that's how email works. And when they got forwarded, sometimes you don't even know. That's the worst part. Another and the more serious issue, actually, if you write a lot of angry email in a corporate environment, some of them will get forwarded to our human resources and become a permanent archive of your behavior. Later on, when they have a leadership position, they will say, this person behaved badly. Let's not promote him. Okay. So it's as serious as that. So it will be used against you. So every time you write an email, it's a serious matter. So next time you receive angry email, you follow four steps. And the first step is hardest, the awareness. Because when you're angry, you, you kind of cannot control yourself. That's the first step is awareness. And I used to do this. When you receive an angry email, you immediately hit reply. And write down your angry reply. Before you hit the send button, you go downstairs for a cup of tea. <laughs> and then when you come, you come back, you change the two lines to yourself. So you write something. And then you compose another email to the other side. Okay. And, and that I, I've told people, and people find it still hard because sometimes just don't remember. So I'm uh, actually asking my engineer to build a tool. When we detect your email has angry tone, <laughs> when you try to click that send button, it will jump away. <laughs> and it will tell you, it will be forwarded to the world. Do you want the world to see that? It will be forwarded to the HR department to document your behavior. Do you really want that? And if you want, you say, career limiting send. <laughs> that will help people have awareness. OK. So now the next step is, once you are aware you are angry, OK, and you can control yourself, you need to have empathy to understand why the other side is angry. The other side must be angry for some reason you agree with or not agree with. But your goal is not to argue with him. Your goal is try to work with him to reach a shared understanding. So you need to understand the other side, why he's angry, and how to make her or she, him less angry. Okay. And then influence how to change her behavior or change your own behavior in order to reach shared understanding. And through that interaction, let the other side know that I want to grow you to be like me because I have high EQ. You don't seem to have high EQ. Whoever sent the angry email has lower EQ. So it's a very proud act of, I'm a high EQ. You should be like me. Let's grow each other together. And just imagine that if you keep doing this, then your team all have high EQ. Then the IQs all multiply each other. Then the whole productivity just jumps through the roof. Now, I did observe that for technical people, when they talk about influence, they say, I don't play politics. I don't play politics. A lot of technical people equate anything in EQ as playing politics. Because once you put a negative connotation on it, then you, of course, you know, don't need to do it. You don't need to go out of your comfort zone to do it. But I tell people, yes, the skill set may be similar, but the difference is the motive. If you're trying to make the right thing happen, it's called influencing. If you're trying to make things happen for the wrong reason, it's called play politics. As long as you have the integrity, what you want to make things happen is the right thing, then you should try everything to influence people. And nobody should call you playing politics. So this is my last slide. So there are two things about scale up the ambition. There are two things about scale out for impact. When you're good, think about where you can be great. And then think about where you can be best. And then identify the meaning for your happiness. Once you decide what you want, work on the max, then your career will be a step function. If you spend all your time on some, your career will be a flat line. Once you want to do big things, you have to look at things end to end, identify the big problem, important problem to solve. By the time you need to get a lot of people to work together, you make sure they have high EQs to work together. Okay. And this is what I learned in the past two decades. And I hope you find it useful. Thank you.
Okay. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Yes. What do you recommend for EQ training resources? EQ training resources. Um, I would say my wife, but that's <laughs> just not available. Because what happened was she's the one who is reading all the books and then train and then taking all the training classes. And whenever I went home and described what happened in my work, then you would say she would say uh, you're doing this very well, but you're not doing that well because of that book. Okay. But she did tell me uh, Dale Carnegie's uh, class. It's an expensive class, but she learned a lot from that. So Dale Carnegie's class is definitely useful. Yes. Oh, I was going to say his book too, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Oh, yeah. People. Yeah, that's amazing that. for people's skills. So have everyone read it. <laughs> that book, I think, is a 1930 something book. Yeah, repeat yeah. it. Yes. So, so there's a book by Dale Carnegie, uh, How to Win Friends and uh, Influence, Influence people. people. Yes. And, it's a, and sometimes I, I tell people that we're all excited about uh, doing technical things, and technical things keep advancing every year, and that's Exciting. But I also tell people maybe something that's <coughs> even bigger than technical stuff is things like this. It has been that way since 1930 something. It must be really, really important for the fundamental of human being. Perhaps even more important than technical stuff. So that's why I think EQ is more important than IQ it does have some meaning. Yes. Yes. It's really hard to change people. Yes. Starting from what age should be EQ <laughs> If you can actually start as a baby. <laughs> yeah, because uh, if you if you never get really angry in front of your baby, then he or she will not get angry. They will just observe the proper behavior. But sometimes it's hard. So you can, and you, can, you can do it at the later stage as well. Because once you get into work, and you encounter all the problems, and you don't know how to solve them, and you find out EQ is the, prop, the way to solve them, you can learn it and then get better there. So I think you can start at any age. And when you say you cannot change people, then we want people to have a growth mindset. So that, that, the, the part that you cannot change is your comfort zone. But if you are willing to get out of comfort zone, then anything can change. Yeah. Do you have questions? Okay, let's thank Eamon again. Thank you.